Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I did. Ba I was bad. I'm going to get a badge in a minute or a name tag. So okay. I'll do that. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit before I get started about the purpose of today's meeting and our structure and agenda. Then after that, we're going to do welcome and introduction. So, the first thing is that. Um, the structure and the purpose of the council is that we gather at least three or four times a year as a group of supporters who are willing to strategize with each other because we come from all kinds of different areas in different fields, which is wonderful and I love the sharing, but also more importantly with the staff of women employed because it gives us an opportunity to help to strategize about ways of increasing uh, low income women's access to as well as their success in college. That's why we're all here. So today's meeting goal is that uh, we, as supporters of women employed, we want to be well-informed advocates. And so today we're going to increase our understanding about the impact of the proposed federal budget and what it will have on women and families participating in education and training programs. So that's a pretty good topic for most of us. Also to help give us uh, insights on the tenor of what's going on in Washington, D.C. And uh, we're going to also learn about the positive movement in higher education at the federal and state level. So we have some great experts today. I hope everyone is as excited as I am by this agenda personally. I get geeked up when I come to Women Employed for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like for you to start by telling us uh, your name, uh, your workplace or job title, or if you're retired and how you were or have become connected with Women Employed and this council. And then there's another question we'd like for you to answer today, which is what is the most burning issue for Illinois and or the country related to higher education? And I'm going to go last because I'd love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> the conference has been unmuted. Okay, so should we start yeah, with, the, how about we start with the people on the phone, if you can do this. Introduce yourself. Did, I hope you heard everything. So your name, uh, your workplace, job title, if you're retired, let us know that, how you became connected with women employed in the council, and what do you think is the most burning issue for Illinois and or the country related to higher education. So go for it. I guess I'll start. start. My name is Bridget Blaney. And I'm an account sales manager in advertising and, um, at a, a Send Integrated Media. Um, we provide um, content and um, advertising solutions for medical associations. And I got connected to the women employed via going to a couple of conferences uh, or um, talks, etc., over the years, and then the luncheon this year, and then I was receiving emails from your staff members about my interest in the councils and I am interested in finding out how I can help and how my expertise could help the causes that you support. And I really don't know what the burning issue is per se except for the end of the day it's well-paying jobs and happy families. Right, who else do we have on the phone? Hi, I'm Dana Gross. Um, I am. I'm looking at. I, I I work for Livingston International. I'm a human resources business partner. Um, I got connected to the, uh, women employed through my daughter, who um, became connected and said, "Hey, mom, you should look at this organization. I think they're pretty. I think it's a good fit for you. I think uh, you'd be interested." Um, and. You know, the, mo the most burning issue uh, for Illinois, certainly, I think, is the budget. I have a son at Northern, so um, he's very worried about, the, you know, the, the people at state schools, whether they be adults or, you know, young adults. Uh, it's the, what's going on in the Illinois budget is certainly affecting their ability to get an education and, I think, overall um, of the costs and the accessibility. Thanks, Dana. Olivia, are you on the phone? Yes, hi. hi. Yes. Oh, are there two? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Okay, hi. My name is Liliana Gentile. I work for uh, Bruto Graphic. Um, uh, also, uh, I graduated in 2015 uh, from Louis University, and uh, I you know, at my uh, uh, 48 year old, 
and uh, I want to help other women to to go to college. Thank you, Liliana. Hi. Um, so I'm Olivia. Um, I, uh, I'm a consultant with a uh, professional services company called WorkSmart. We do implementations of project and portfolio management software. Um, as far as a connection to women employed, I just kind of did some research about um, uh, companies and or organizations in Chicago that were doing good stuff and uh, got connected with Linda Ballard and she introduced me to the council. And um, as far as burning issues, you know, I don't feel that I'm totally educated on what's going on currently, but I do think on a personal level, it's time or lack of time. Definitely. Thank you. Um, I think that's everyone on the phone besides Amy Ellen, and we're going to introduce her and, and have her speak to us in a minute. Did I miss anyone on the phone line? Okay, why don't we go around the table? Okay, that's fine. I'm Amy Jordan. I'm at Loyola University. I'm full-time faculty teaching leadership and ethics, uh, and I'm director of special projects. So um, that's a broad range of wonderful things to do in the course of a lifetime. Um, and I, I'm real, I, I was introduced to um, this organization through Dina Carr, who's our director of partnerships, and she said, I know where you need to land. Mm -hmm. And um, she's correct. And I'm going to speak through the voice of my students in saying that one of the issue, a big issue that I see um, with higher ed is the need to help my students fulfill their dreams. Um, I'm amazed at the talents and abilities and drive of uh, returning adult students who um, have so much to give and do it so earnestly. And um, I, I, my goal is to make, make that opportunity happen for them. Once we find each other, we have a good thing going. But I am beginning to realize what a long road it is for them to, many of them, to be able to get back to the, um, the goal that has been there somewhere in their back of their minds for too long. I'm Shira Salmon I'm with the Marin Morris Kaplan Family Foundation. Um, I was originally connected to women employed through graduate school through um, some studies on work and family policy, but with my current job, there's been more um, kind of job-related intersections there. Um, and the burning issue, I guess for me, for in the most immediate terms, I keep coming back to affordability and all the issues that spiral out from there. <clears throat> Hello, um, I'm Ileana Mora, and I am the incoming president and CEO of Women Employed. Apologies, I am getting over a cold. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today and to learn a little bit more about each of you and about the work of the council. I'm just going to hit mute and it'll like, okay. on the phone. So I'm going to just mute the folks on the phone as we continue with the The conference has been muted. <laughs> I'm Randy Gurian. I am recently retired as the CEO of The Harbor, an agency which serves homeless and runaway girls in the north and northwest suburbs primarily, but also DCFS wards from the larger greater wow. Chicago area. And I was introduced to women employed by going to an event at Bernstein where they talked about barriers to women, and I was just blown away. And I was kind of looking for what what's next, and I thought this just builds on my passion for opportunities for, for women and young women. And my real concern <coughs> is, is slightly is that entering young woman who at 18 or 19 is homeless, is maybe parenting, um, frankly, is it suburban because we're finding more and more kids are out you know, poverty is bypassing the city and going straight to the suburbs these days. And their access and preparedness for education. We find our kids do incredible things when the barriers are down. And we've had graduates with master's degrees. And, but getting them over the initial leap is, is huge. 
<clears throat> oh, hi, my name is Susan um, Ismail. I work here at the Student Advocate Coordinator. I'm also an adult uh, college uh, student um, and going into well, finishing up my second year, um, hopefully next year my third. And um, I would say one of the most impressing issues that I see is the devaluing of higher education across the board, whether that be at a state level or federal level, where we just don't value it as a common good, and therefore we're defunding it. So, yeah. Um, my name is Lorraine Chavez, and I'm the Director of Policy at Chicago Jobs Council. Um, I think the burning issue for the city and the state and even nationally is really the deteriorating labor market in terms of wages, conditions, and actual production and creation of good jobs. And um, higher education from starting from any, <coughs> any level past high school is really the means for people to have and have access to the shrinking number of good jobs that do exist. So I'm very passionate about uh, the entire adult education cycle. Hi again, I'm Laurel Swader and I am director of the Office for HR Development and Recruitment and the Allied Professional Association of the American Library Association. Work yeah. Workforce development issues for library personnel uh, I'm also a former faculty, adjunct faculty from Dominican University, and I serve on a couple of uh, alumni boards. One is Governor State University, um, and it's interesting because uh, a couple, I became involved with women employed because of the things dealing with labor and women's issues, and my predecessor had been involved, and I also uh, support the luncheon. That was the big draw for me. But interestingly enough, I just recently, and this is terrible, figured out or found out about the level of homelessness and poverty among students in Illinois. And I think that's huge. I also know that because of the budget crisis in the state, we are losing our best and our brightest to other states. Not only is the population in Illinois shrinking, but we're losing folks who are going to school and making choices up in other states because they can't get any support here. So that's just at the local level. Nationally, there are other issues. Hi. Um, I'm Luisa Hernandez. I'm the Dean of Academic Affairs at Instituto del Progreso Latino, and um, I became involved with unemployed through, um, uh, through a conference, adult education, career pathway uh, conferences, bridge programs that I've been involved with. Um, one of my concerns at the federal level is the Perkins Act, which supports career technical education, very, very important. Uh, it's an avenue for the students who are not going to college to get some good training, some good jobs uh, that sometimes are overlooked because it's all about four years of education. Hi, I'm Judith Cossie, uh, working as an independent consultant in workforce development. And I've worked with women employed for many years on a range of issues, bridge programs, career pathways, um, Union Pacific projects, and uh, social emotional learning, to name a few. And um, my burning issue is, or issues are the structure of the labor market. And I frankly am worried about public education, public mm -hmm. higher education as an institution that we're really deinvesting in the state and, and other states. <coughs> I'm Anna Rappaport. I'm a retired actuary, uh, and I chair the committee. I'm post retirement needs and risks of the Society of Actuaries. Uh, I got to women employed many years ago. I was very concerned, and that's all I am about um, women's retirement security, and so much of that is about jobs. So that, that connected me to women for many years. Um, so my, uh, my personal burning issue are, is not just about the labor market, but the labor market continues to people that need and want to be uh, away of retirement and that's it's a sort of special issue within the broader issue and I think for Illinois the big issue is probably about the money. Mm -hmm. okay. Hi, sorry <laughs> came in late. I'm Gabby Zola. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at KL. That's the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. And we connect learning and work for adults. 
um, working student, and I've worked with Lincoln Flake for many years. We started an initiative together called Conceive and Degree Chicago, helping the over 300,000 Chicagoans who have some college but no degree cross the finish line. Um, and is it a burning issue related to our work, or? Well, it's interesting. So Amy <laughs> Ellen uh -huh. uh, from Center on Law and Social Policy uh -huh. said, oh, I can't wait. I'm going to present national issues, blah, blah, blah. And she says, but I want to hear from the state. Okay. And I was like, well, I think you might hear the budget 20 times. But mm -hmm. I said, yeah. okay, well, put that yeah. question out there. And so she said, well, you, they could also uh, yeah. share insights. So this was really Amy Ellen's question to us cool. to, right. to see what we're thinking at so the state level. Not, I'm not in my tail seat now, but for me personally, it's getting our governor out of office <laughs> and getting the governor elected. Yep. Um, wearing my tail hat, I think it's helping. Um, I think it's helping adults make informed choices about education linked to a career. Mm -hmm. So I'm really tired of the headline being "Is college worth it?" Mm -hmm. because what we're really talking about is is college worth it for poor people because mm -hmm. I right. we all went to college. Mm -hmm. So, or we're going to college right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think the question needs to be reframed in terms of helping adults make informed choices linked to a career that's going to be able to support their family. Um, and it's, it's about which decisions are worth it for to get to that place. Hi, I'm Carolyn O. I'm an executive coach and I'm also associate director of leadership development at the Duke School of Business. And I also, I'm here because I actually, I also worked at a career college, so I feel like I worked at both ends of the higher education spectrum. I was at a yeah, International Academy of Design and Technology for five years um, as a program chair and as a dean. And for me, the burning issue is, you know, I, I saw lots of uh, students Know, homeless student, like it, it only took one incident to wipe them out. Mm -hmm. So yep. I think yep. that the issue is, is not just uh, not just the, uh, the budget for higher education, but it's those supporting services that allow this to be a sustainable process. Mm -hmm. And I'm connected to Women Employed because many years ago I met Mary Kay, mm -hmm. and uh, she kept talking about this great organization. <laughs> um, so my name is Mary Kate Devine. I'm the director of community initiatives here at Women Employed, and I get the pleasure of hosting events and bringing people together virtually in person, um, managing the councils and committees of our organization. And um, I'm going into my tenth year uh, as a staff person, so uh, almost happy anniversary. Uh, <laughs> and thrilled to be here. And we've got a hell of a lot of work to do, so I'm not going anywhere. Um, and I think, yeah, the burning issue for me, so I have four young children, two are in elementary education, two are in preschool, and I think the issue for Illinois is playing games with CPS um, and using us as a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. um, I, before I hand it over to Sarah, I also always make the comment and forgot to that cookies are to eat and not a still <laughs> life, uh, <laughs> and we've got plenty of still water and sparkling water, and the other thing that we'll get to near the end of our conversation, after you hear from Amy Ellen as well as Sarah, um, is a couple action opportunities, action taking opportunities. So on today's sign-in sheet, if you haven't signed in, please do. And you'll notice there was a new box I added to make sure that you're in our action network. Because uh, we've been running some lists lately and it's shocking who's not <coughs> in the action network. Like people who are so well connected to the organization, uh, come to meetings, come to events, uh, personal relationships, but we really want to be sure um, we are respectful of your inbox. Uh, we realize with the current landscape, people are getting a lot of emails, and so we really try to be sympathetic to people's inbox uh, and send items truly when they are urgent, when there's an imminent signing passage movement. Um, so if you already signed in and on your way out, you want to just check the box, I can check and confirm that you're part of the Action Network. Um, so. uh, my name is Sarah Labadee. I'm the Senior Policy Associate at Women Employed as well. Um, and like Mary Kay, I'm, I think I might be in my, have just started my 10th year. I've been here for nine. Um, and I am, uh, let's see, what's the most burning issue for Illinois? 
I would say the most burning issue, and I'm just going to choose this because nobody has said it and because I was working on it this morning, is reforming developmental education. Mm. Um, so nobody has said that, so I feel yeah. good about that. Yeah. <laughs> you can take that one. Um, and so usually in our meetings, um, we just, I always present some level setting information just to make sure we all start on the same page that this is our vision for higher education and just in case phones, uh, folks on the phone aren't looking at screens at the same time, that all women can enter and complete the higher education that they need to make a better economic future. And so a lot of the times you'll hear um, women employed staff talking about, you know, that really the organizational goal is, you know, let's ensure that women are treated well and respected in their current jobs and that they are able to build and develop the skills they need for that next job or even that next uh, promotion at their current workplace. And then the last kind of level setting, and I believe Carolyn spoke to it a few folks, we really do see sort of that wraparound um, approach to education and training and thinking of not only access, uh, but also success and so you know our graphics here show a student at the front door and how are we increasing access through financial aid uh, student supports once they're in so like you said it's like they can be one uh, you know broken down car or not enough funding to get on public transportation uh, making choices between rent and groceries and child care and so really trying to ensure that there's that system surrounding students to support them so that they're not one crisis away from dropping out and, and falling out of the education system. And then Louisa has been involved, a couple of other partners at the table, really working with women employed on innovative programs. And so making sure that whether it's at community-based organizations as well as community colleges, you know, what are the programs that have the data that really show the models work? And so bridge programming and career foundations are a couple that we have recently worked on. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Amy Ellen. Uh, Amy Ellen Duke ben Benfield, I keep wanting to add an S right there in the middle of her name, uh, is a great friend of Women Employed. I met her, I think, the first year that I started with the organization when Judith and I were working on a little thing called Shifting Gears, uh, when the state of Illinois participated in a regional initiative that actually helped establish the Bridge Program policy. And the Bridge Program, you know, just connecting people with lower basic skills. I think our state policy officially starts at the fifth grade level. Yeah. Um, and then connecting people with those preparatory courses to help them increase their numeracy and literacy and, and basic understanding so that they are comfortable and prepared uh, to start college level courses. Mm -hmm. And we, I bet I called Amy Ellen like shortly after the election and we were thinking about planning out our agendas for upcoming adult college success council meetings and I said, well, who thought that was going to happen? Um, <laughs> you know, you're one of our national partners and you're just a great thinker and doer and we would love to schedule. We were very intentional to not have her join us in the spring but to wait. Uh, until this June meeting so that we'd have about six months under the new administration to just have a sense uh, at the national perspective, you know, what is going on and, and what are some, what is going on. Uh, so I just wanted to share her bio so, so before she dies into sharing her expertise. Uh, she's a senior policy analyst at CLASP, Center on Law and Social Policies Center for Post-Secondary and Economic Success. Um, Amy Ellen's focus is access to and success in post-secondary education and training for low-income students. Amy Ellen analyzes and advocates for policies that better serve low-income adults and other non-traditional students and provides technical assistance to federal, state, and local advocates in government in these areas. And that was very much where our relationship started. She clasped and her colleagues were providing Illinois with technical assistance to help us build the bridge program policy. Um, Amy Ellen also directed class benefits access for college completion initiative, which sought to increase access to public benefits and financial aid. So the combination, like we said in that prior slide for wraparound services, public benefits and financial aid for low income students is at colleges across the country. Building on that work, she is advising the federal and state governments on better aligning public benefit policies to support low income college completion. And because clearly Amy Ellen has been around for a while, she previously led class federal adult education and higher education advocacy efforts. So we are thrilled to have you with us today, Amy Ellen. I'll get you to your first slide and are you unmuted? Yes, uh, thank you so much. 
for having me. I'm a longtime fan of Women Employed, and as Mary Kay said, uh, we have collaborated on policy for years. And I, I, so when she asked me if I would do this, I w said, of course, I'd be happy to do this um, and talk to the, to the council. And I'm excited uh, to hear um, the different walks of life that you all come from, as well as uh, some of the overlapping and, and different priorities and concerns that each of you had. Um, I share probably every one of those. Uh, and that's what drives me to, to work in this arena. Um, a little bit about CLASP for those of you who aren't familiar with us. We're a national nonpartisan anti-poverty nonprofit uh, based in DC. I telecommute from Brooklyn though that advocates for smart policy solutions to help individuals get out of poverty, find employment, and become self-sufficient. We work at the federal, state, and local levels. We develop practical yet visionary strategies for reducing poverty, promoting economic security, and addressing barriers faced by people of color. So there's a lot of overlap there with what Women Employed does. We work in five overarching areas, which makes it um, easy to, to do a little bit of more of the cross-cutting work that faces adult uh, low-income college students, so not just in post-secondary and workforce development, but also child care and early childhood ed, youth policy, income work supports, and job quality, as a couple of you were talking about. Um, and the post-secondary work at class focuses specifically on low-income non-traditional students, such as adults, uh, in some ways similar to a couple folks who are sitting around the table right now. Um, I'm going to cover four different areas in my talk or presentation. I've, I've never done a, a, a remote presentation where there are a bunch of people in one room. I wish I could be with you. Um, I'm going to share with you what's the feeling in Washington, uh, the President's federal budget, um, and also talk about uh, the health care legislation in, in that uh, area federal higher education developments, and then uh, briefly a little time on aligning public benefits and post-secondary policies. Hey, Ann Allen, I just wanted yes. to jump in. I realized, so we'll share these slides. I know it, like a lot more words are going to come out of Ann Allen's mouth, um, and so we can also get the recording. Um, but I did, I am a copious note taker, but I, in case you don't want to uh, and you just want to listen, you don't have to. Uh, but I just realized I should mention that. And then I also forgot to ask when I was introducing myself. So one of the things Women Employed is trying to do uh, in the spirit of expanding virtual engagement is also putting some, like when we're out and about at hearings and testimonies and meetings is to do some live tweeting. Mm -hmm. um, so I might click a couple pictures. I, I don't have to attribute everything, you know, I wouldn't tell like Gabby wants to vote or honor out of, you know, off the train. <laughs> 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 Quote that directly. Um, and in fact, women employed wouldn't say that on our Twitter feed. So, yeah, tell the lawyers. They wouldn't say that anyway. Um, but is there anybody who's absolutely like, don't you dare take my picture? Okay, because I'll just kind of take it and then be like, oh, here we are, you go to college. Okay. And speaking of cute pictures, here's this child communicating with the feeling in Washington. Uh, yeah, as I was, it was, I was finishing up my PowerPoint last night, I was, or yesterday afternoon, my son came home from school, he's a kindergartner, and he'd never seen PowerPoint before, nor had he ever seen the potentials of clip art, so he insisted then on, on wanting to help me <laughs> with the presentation, and I thought he actually did a pretty good job, given his choices. Um, and, and this does capture, uh, I would say, I think probably the way a lot of folks feel in that room, and that we feel um, in D.C., um, even though I don't live in D.C., I spend a lot of time in D.C., so, uh, and I also talked to some of my colleagues to get some different perspectives on this um, and see if anyone wasn't feeling this way and actually couldn't find anyone. Um, per, if you think of the angle around um, low-income college students, if I were uh, promoting um, another set of policies, I might have a smiley face, but yeah. um, unfortunately, uh, it's a tough, tough environment that we're in right now. Uh, many of you probably know the President signed an omnibus spending bill to fund the federal government through September 30th. The bill rejected Trump's demands to cut key domestic programs and build a wall on our southern border. However, we're concerned that it failed to set adequate funding levels for programs that help low-income people meet basic needs. And that includes then when we talk about um, homeless college students or college students needing access to SNAP, 
access to child care so that they can uh, complete and get a good family supporting job. There are many more threats on the horizon. Trump <coughs> remains committed, as I think all of us now are realizing, to repealing the ACA, passing tax cuts for the wealthy, and passing a federal year 2018 budget that fulfills, um, I think, what we would say are some disturbing campaign promises. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after this. Uh, some, I asked a couple folks in the office how they felt the tone was. Um, the head of our post-secondary and workforce development team uh, said he's deeply worried about the horrible things that are being proposed and have a chance of actually happening, with the one bright spot being the incredible energy around the country, as it seems more people than ever are paying attention and getting engaged in the resistance. I don't know about you all, but I definitely feel that um, in New York, um, sort of a sense of, as this kid's face shows, uh, dread about what we've heard, but um, knowing that, that actually there are some good things going on around the country um, as, as folks mobilize. From our youth team leader who is focused on that group of youth who are 16 to 24, she uh, pointed out that we're receiving some confusing messages right now from the administration because workforce, they've tabbed this workforce week. I don't know how many of you heard about that, but it's a it's a big topic in D.C., um, but while promoting Workforce Week, the President's budget proposed 40% 40, 40 cuts to WIOA, the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act, um, which is our primarily workforce development funding vehicle. Um, we're also seeing threats to civil rights and rolls back, rollbacks on uh, criminal justice reform that threaten immigrants and communities of color. Youth of color are especially targeted as the DOJ seeks to roll back Obama-era advancements. And the role of federal government in solving problems is not valued as much as it was in the prior administration as evidenced by budget proposals and undermining the safety net. Um, and that we, we do have, and I think the media has covered this pretty well, a divide between the administration and the moderate Republicans on the budget. Um, around the higher ed community, I think folks are feeling uh, there is this you know, kind of feeling of trepidation around the fact that uh, Secretary DeVos has not fully staffed up in the department. So everything you've heard about um, the failure to, to, to uh, submit names for approval for uh, associate, you know, assistant secretarial positions, folks leading different offices and that kind of thing has been really slow, including at Ed. Um, and she hasn't, um, there haven't been any real clear messages yet around uh, what could be coming down the pike around adult issues. We know that, you know, Workforce Development Week, the administration is holding up apprenticeship as, as an important model um, for that. Um, in D.C., just as probably happens in some ways in, in the Midwest, everyone watched the Comey hearing. Um, but in the meanwhile, healthcare reform is happening outside public view. And it's important to, to remember that, that there, that there are a lot of things that are sucking the air out of the room as folks are um, you know, tapping away at the social safety net. And there is some concern that if, if the Higher Education Act reauthorization were to happen this year, it would happen that way. Um, and that, you know, want to remind everyone that if you have something that you're passionate about, let your congressperson know. It's important to know, you know, for them to know what your priorities are, um, even if they're, you know, usually sitting on the same side of the fence as, as you do on those things. So one thing Mary Kay and I talked about was the opportunity for people to ask questions in between each, uh, each section of my presentation. I can't guarantee you answers. But um, I can offer up my colleagues, uh, for those of you who want to dive a little deeper on some of these issues that I might not know as much about. So does anyone have any questions about the tone? And does what I say resonate with some of what you all are feeling out there in outside the DC bubble? Amy Ellen, this is Gabby. I'm wondering if anyone is feeling um, that all the turbulence and turmoil and lack of hiring that there's any silver lining in that for our agenda because just a lot of stuff won't get done. Yes. I do think that there is a feeling of, there is some feeling around that. Um, 
and and there are still folks who who did some really good work that I'm going to talk about afterwards. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the presentation, around a, a letter that came out uh, in the fall encouraging um, better alignment between benefits policy and higher ed policy, that that a lot of those folks are really trying to stick it out in the administration. And right now, a lot of those career folks are in positions that normally are political appointee positions. For instance, mm -hmm. Kim Ford is heading OCTE right now, the Office of Career and Technical and Adult Education. Um, she's a career person um, and uh, is definitely you know, in tune, much more in tune, I'd say, with our issues than some, you know, some of the folks that have been bantered about by Secretary DeVos. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the interim, I think there's some truth to that. I think where it gets kind of tricky is that when I'll talk next about the budget, that a lot of what's proposed in the budget, although it will ne probably never make it through at those levels, mm -hmm. that it does reflect a view in Washington that's been popularized by the Tea Party and the Freedom Caucus and some of those folks who are more on the right and, and you know, Paul Ryan, to be candid. And so, so there, there is a requirement on all of us who are passionate about adult college issues to be vigilant um, and, and pay attention, as my colleague said, to including, you know, what noise might be going on in the background. Um, while you know there are bigger stories that capture all of our national attention, that there may be more subtle things happening in the background, especially in Congress right now. And then, and then I also know, um, you know, they're already making changes in the Office of Civil Rights, and have already made um, decisions that have have implications um, around choosing not to enforce particular things. There's some questions around. Um, what you know, there had been a lot of good work in the previous administration around protecting. I know this is totally off the subject, but if we're talking about women, um, protecting women's rights on college campuses and protect protections around um, sexual assault and that kind of thing. And there's concern around um, rolling back some of that, um, rolling back some of the protections around students of color. And so some of that is already just going on. They have been faster to staff up the Office of Civil Rights in a few of the departments than they are different offices, which is interesting to me. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of like you have to, you have to keep your eye, you know, on the ball um, and know that things could be going on in the background. Any other questions about the tenor in D.C.? Amy, this is Laurel. I have a question about um, the budget itself. There are a lot of groups who are having difficulty with the budget and areas that are being cut. Are there any kinds of coalitions pulling together? Because it seems like everyone is kind of working in different siloed areas, and they're all com everybody is advocating and, and encouraging their advocates to, uh, to get to their Congress people. But is there any type of um, joint effort in Washington with these groups to kind of get together? Because everyone says, oh, this is great, but that's not our issue. This is our issue. Yeah, so coming, I mean, I'll talk about the budget in a second, but I'm happy to answer that question now because it actually goes back to the sequestration that some of you, that may sound like a completely foreign word to some of you. Others of you may remember um, several years back, there was a bipartisan commission that was going to decide on a set of budget cuts um, this was under the Obama administration, and they couldn't come to agreement, and so there was an across-the-board cut um, of all programs. And, and since that time, there has been a group that advocate in Washington, D.C. and go to the Hill around the non, so it's non-defense discretionary spending. So all those groups that fall out of defense um, have come together and are doing Hill visits. Um, and then I also know all the workforce groups um, work together, and then there are coalitions around in higher ed around um, saving the Pell Grant um, and that sort of thing. Uh, but if you're interested in being connected with with any of any of those groups, um, you know I can definitely uh, put you in touch offline. Okay, thank you. It's a good question. So digging in here to the President's budget proposal, um, 
I was um, I have to say I've worked at CLASP for about 14 years and there's been a real transition at CLASP and not only did we get a new executive director in the last couple years but we have I read some of the language that that we use around some of these issues and think wow this is really serious um, language and makes me a little uncomfortable but I realize that's the point because some of these some of you know these proposal um, the proposal really makes some devastating cuts to programs that support children families and individuals of modest means um, slashes investments in Americans America's future and in a lot of ways will destabilize local and state budgets which would in turn precipitate a next round of deep cuts to basic services um, as you all are well familiar with in Illinois the president's budget request cuts $1.7 trillion over the course of 10 years uh, from anti-poverty programs, virtually every program that you can think of that helps reduce poverty and support ordinary Americans. And so when I think about what are the supports for adult college students, um, Medicaid and CHIP, Children's Health Insurance, Nutrition Assistance, so SNAP and WIC, uh, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Block Grant, the TANF Block Grant, Support for People with Disabilities, and the Earned Income Tax Credit, um, on top of the $54 billion in 2018 cuts to domestic programs that were already previewed in the so-called skinny budget that the President introduced two months ago. Uh, about $610 billion in additional cuts on top of already deep cuts proposed by the AHCA, cuts to SNAP of over $191 billion um, over 10 years, eliminates assistance for low-income families and seniors to pay heating and cooling bills. Some of you might know um, that program, uh, LIHEAP. Yep. And then takes away the, the children tax credit from children living with immigrant tax-paying um, parents who file taxes using an individual taxpayer um, ID. And that's a group of about 5 million children nationwide, the vast majority of whom are actually United States citizens. Also cuts the TANF block grant by 10% for all states and more for some on top of a 30% reduction in the block grant as a result of inflation since its enactment 20 years ago, sharply reducing state resources to help low-income families avoid destitution. Um, several of us can probably remember um, earlier in TANF, it was actually a decent support in states that were committed to uh, helping um, low-income mothers and fathers get access to education and training. Some states took a lot more of a workforce-first approach. Um, but we have seen you know, also a decimation of some of those more generous education and training programs that were fed through TANF programs uh, due to the erosion of the block grant over time. So why we're here to think about the threats to students in the President's budget, um, we think the dis disinvestments are short-sighted. They harm vital programs that strengthen our nation's future by helping today's children, youth, and adults get a secure start in life, get an education, and move up on the job through education, through post-secondary ed and training, which is, I think, part of the vision for, for all of you around that table, as well as us at CLASP. Um, for low-income students pursuing post-secondary education, the budget is a perfect storm of cuts makes it harder for students to complete the education they need to move up on the job. The budget proposal would slash funding for the Federal Work Study Program by almost 50%, eliminating employment for more than 300,000 low-income students working their way through college, about 25% of whom have an income below $12,000. The 2017 budget for work study in Illinois is about 40, 400 and, I mean 48 million, 48.3 million. Under the Trump budget, it would be barely $24 million. Um, it would cut by half the current 29,000 students who receive it, leading to nearly 14,000 students losing eligibility under the President's work budget. Um, the budget would also remove $3.9 billion from the Pell Grant budget, threatening to destabilize the program, which already covers less than 30% of the average cost of college attendance, which I think all of us who have been following um, post-secondary for a while know that as Pell has eroded, state budgets haven't kept up, um, state aid programs have not kept up, and that's how we're ending up with more and more students in kind of dire situations. 
The budget also proposes to eliminate the Supplemental Education Opportunity Grants. That's an aid program that we don't often talk about, um, I'd say, publicly. But it covers college costs for more than 1.6 million students with the greatest need each year. That money goes out by formula to colleges, and they target it to the lowest income students. Um, currently, 60, about 62,000 students in Illinois receive SEOG grants with an average grant of about $788 a year, and this would be zeroed out under the President's budget. Um, I do not think, we don't think the SEOG and work study um, would actually be cut at these levels or zeroed out as SEOG is, um, but given these markers, I would say it's probably a good chance that they will, exist, they will um, sustain some level of cut. Um, for instance, if, if what the uh, ultimate agreement is, is across the board cut by 5% or 10%, that those have real numbers connected to them. And once the budget is finalized and passes, I'd encourage you to circle back around to our website um, because my colleagues have done some great state-by-state uh, -state analysis that um, can be good talking points or thinking points around this. It also, the budget also abolish, abolishes subsidized student loans, which prevent interest from accruing on college loans for low and moderate income students while they are in school, and ends loan forgiveness for students who go into lower paying public service careers. The budget also harms students with dependent children by eliminating the Child Care Access Means Parents in School program, Campus which provides $15 million in federal funds to offer child care services so students can attend class and stay on track in their post-secondary educations. There are also, um, since we're on the subject of threats, and we're in Workforce Development Week, threats to workforce development. Um, the budget drastically shrinks investment in the skills that workers need to advance at every point from youth to adulthood. It proposes severe cuts to adult basic ed and literacy program, which I know a couple of you in the room are really concerned about career and tech ed programs in high school and college, which I also heard some concern about, and workforce training for low-income youth and adults through, um, I'll say it short, WIOA, or the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which was, as a reminder, passed by Congress in 2014 with overwhelming bipartisan support, which makes the the severe cut of almost 40% um, to workforce training for low-income youth and adults through Title I of WIOA, uh, you know, just astonishing given that the program had such bipartisan support in 2014. Uh, WIOA Title I youth um, would drop in Illinois from $40 million to $24 million. Um, and Illinois would see a $15 million cut in WIOA Title I for adults. Um, down from 37 million down, um, yeah, 37 million down to 17 million. The budget would also cut um, 96 million or 16 percent from WIOA Title II's adult basic ed um, literacy grants. The budget also proposes cuts of 168 million or 15 percent from Perkins CTE. Uh, in 2016, um, and we're going to be updating these numbers, we just got new numbers yesterday, but the federal year 2016 Illinois allocation was $39 million. Under the President's budget, it, it would see a cut of $5.3 million. It would also dramatically reduce funding for the Corporation for National and Community Service which would destroy the AmeriCorps program, which currently enables 80,000 folks to support natural disaster relief, <laughs> provide education and social services to low-income youth and elderly people, and help communities solve pressing issues such as hunger and poverty. So those issues that we're, we're all concerned about, and I'm sure several of us have crossed paths with AmeriCorps for folks working in our organization or trying to help the populations that we're most concerned about. Um, in all these other, in all these areas and others that are part of, as I referred to earlier, the domestic discretionary budget, um, the proposed cuts are even more damaging than they appear because they come after years of declining funding as a result of those sequester cuts, which I mentioned, which have cut many programs by 20% or more over the past seven years. So we're already talking about, for instance, the 39% cut in workforce training programs shrinks a base that is already about 19% less than in 2010, adjusting for inflation. So that didn't 
impact the Pell Grant program, but it did impact the variety of other programs that we often think about to either help provide a bridge to post-secondary education and training or help provide those wraparound supports that are so essential for adults. Um, and so that's, that's a, a tough one um, to swallow in a lot of ways. And then um, before I take questions on this section, I wanted to talk to you all about the AHCA, which I know it's been in the, the news a lot, and we were all um, sort of waiting at the edge of our seats on what the CBO estimate would show regarding the impact on, on folks, and 23 million is where the CBO came out, um, would lose their health insurance by 2016 if the AHCA is enacted. The AHCA um, is the Republican House uh, health care bill that's, that was passed. 14 million would lose coverage from Medicaid. And the AHCA, you know, it's not just about um, cutting folks off from, from Medicaid, but it would fundamentally undermine Medicaid by replacing the federal-state partnership, which now includes um, the feds covering 90% of the expenses with per capita caps or block grants. So it would no longer be an entitlement. Um, it would grow. It looks like per capita caps is where, um, where they'd like to come out and, and Speaker Ryan would like to come out. Um, so you would see growth um, if more people came on, but you would never see growth in the amount of funds that would be coming in per person. And if we think about the aging of our population and the folks, um, you know, we, sometimes, sometimes even I have to be reminded that it's not just um, really young, you know, kids who are on Medicaid or low-income adults, but that that actually the bulk of Medicaid costs go to low-income elderly folks who are in nursing homes and that kind of thing, and that we have to think about the fact that those per capita caps would be pretty deadly as we think about the demographics of Medicaid changing over time. If states were to increase their Medicaid spending to cover lost federal revenue, state Medicaid spending would increase by 16% under the HCA, increases would be largest in low-income expansion states. So Illinois took the expansion. You may recall under the ACA, states could um, decide to expand their Medicaid program or not, and it ended up being that um, it broke a lot. Uh, it broke across a lot of political lines, but in a, in, all, in some ways yes, and in some ways no. For instance, Kentucky and West Virginia um, expanded Medicaid. They would see some of the largest. Um, largest uh, state um, obligations to pick up from the feds to be able to continue that, that expansion. And that when it comes down to it, um, at the state level, since you all do have to balance your budget, uh, states, you know, to be candid, will, will likely cut higher education funding if they decide to continue coverage um, of the Medicaid expansion crew because the money just isn't coming in. As you, I mean, Illinois is a perfect example of that. And so I try to explain to folks in the higher ed community, you know, one, you should care about Medicaid because a lot of your students receive Medicaid, and that's a valuable support. Um, we know that the primary reason adults and, you know, students in general actually drop out is due to finances, and there was some great research that was done a few years ago that looked at the role of health care expenses in that. Um, and that definitely plays a role. And so the ACA and the Medicaid expansion has meant a lot in that context because the Medicaid expansion also um, led to more uh, single um, low-income folks being eligible for Medicaid than they were in the past. And so it's, it's worth keeping that in mind. And then also recalling that oftentimes health spending and higher ed spending end, ended up, end up pitted against each other. And the importance of trying to build some coalitions between, let's say, the health access health um, policy community as well as the higher ed community. As many of you are probably aware, because it's been pretty big in the in the media, no one has seen the Senate health care bill yet, let alone had hearings on it. Um, but the rumors are that they're going to send it to the CBO for a score this week. Um, and it sounds like it's almost as bad as the AHCA, maybe with a longer glide path for, to cuts in Medicaid, but with millions of people still losing coverage. Um, and so that's, 
that's the, the final word that I have for you on the AHCA and the pending legislation in the Senate. Any questions? <laughs> Other than just, you know, throwing yourself on the ground and sobbing. Yeah. Um, so this may be naive, um, mm -hmm. but I, I'm just flabbergasted at looking at this. But does anyone care about the impact of, the, of this? And, you know, sort of we hear that the budget, uh, that they say, well, this will create economic mm. growth. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's their excuse. But we know because of the job market that the jobs that are being created are low-income jobs. Right. Is, is there any way to craft an argument that will matter? <laughs> and who do you send it to? I mean, who's yeah. the client? I mean, who will listen? You know, is it just the two women Republicans? <laughs> you, know? Um, who, you know, do you guys see a how should we, you know, proceed <laughs> rationally and strategically? Um, well, I think, I mean, the moderate Dems and, and Republicans are still the, the target here. Um, and, and I think you ask, you ask a good question. I do think it's still worth weighing in, like there's a big weigh-in around on Medicaid this week. Um, and even though the House has already voted, for it, for those of you in districts where you might have someone who um, is is more moderate on this issue to to call and weigh in, that that really matters. I know people. I know it feels like it doesn't often matter, but um, it does. <laughs> They're paying attention and taking counts and all of that sort of thing. Um, and then I think it's you know it's also on on each of us and our organizations to to work on crafting that argument that resonates for the populations that we're most concerned about. I am driven more than ever, you know, already one of my, one of my areas of expertise is trying to connect more low income college students to public benefits as a way to address basic living needs that right now are going unmet, um, given that financial aid hasn't kept up, you know, in Illinois MAP grants have been cut, all of that kind of thing. Um, on, on my end, I also <clears throat> this year and my job goals want to mobilize more higher ed folks to weigh in on Medicaid and SNAP cuts and and we're going to see um, the farm bill is up for up for um, reauthorization next year and so we're probably going to see some um, you know proposed cuts and changes to eligibility and all that kind of stuff. Uh, down the road too, and so to remember, you know, if you're if you're higher ed um, or adult ed, that you're not just focused on uh, higher ed policy or post-secondary education policy or workforce development policy, but to also think about some of these other social supports that that the folks that you're most concerned about um, need access to. And I know that might not be a very satisfying answer. <laughs> Well, I think what I was just going to jump in, Emil, and it's Mary Kay, that, you know, in a few minutes, Sarah Labby, and I know you have a couple slides on this too, that despite all odds, we are still seeing positive movement. And so, you know, I, I know you feel like maybe the answer doesn't satisfy, but I wonder, I'm just also being like the friendly timekeeper that is 107, and I do yeah. want to be sure that in addition to getting to other content that we do have a chance to hear some good news uh, for our mental health. Um, and I know you highlight a few things at the national level. Sarah's got a couple wins at the state level, so I just wanted to do my PSA uh, there in the middle. Yes, I will, um, I will wrap this up pretty quickly um, because I doubt, because there's not as much, uh, what's coming is a little bit faster. Um, hey, Amy Ellen, can I ask sure. one, uh, one question? This is Sarah, so, you know, I'm taking my sure. own time. Sure. Um, the, <laughs> the um, you know, I know you've mentioned, right, it's, it's unlikely to pass in its current state or practically not possible that it will pass in its current state. But what's the, you know, kind of blending tenor plus budget? What's the, how bad will it be? Um. I think people are a lot more concerned about health 
healthcare this week than they were last week. I think folks felt right. pretty good about this bulwark of of moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats, and um, and so there's definitely greater concern this week um, around the budget. Like I said, it's hard to know at the end of the day where everything is going to end up, but this lays out a marker. There will probably be cuts um, because the Republicans are in control of, of both houses right now. Um, and so, you know, I don't have a whole lot more other than that. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, especially as they're doing it under the cover of night. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it makes it harder. Uh, so w- moving on to, to higher ed, you know, I think there was some optimism that HEA could happen this year, but the timeline keeps slipping, and now if anything is going to happen, it will be Perkins um, that will be on a, a quicker um, path, glide path. It's already been passed by the House, bipartisan, and um, was voted out of committee unanimously. Uh, representative um, from Illinois, Krishna Murthy, and co-introduced the bill, and it better aligns Perkins with WIOA, introduces career pathways, which is something Illinois has been a leader around, uses the same metrics for post-secondary as WIOA, WIOA does. Um, oh, I spoke too soon. It's expected to pass the House. They're looking at it for next week. And the Senate may take it up, but as is often the case um, for those who follow uh, education pretty closely, the Senate is often inclined to do its own thing. Um, And so, you know, it's hard to know. Um, The tone in the higher ed community right now, um, there's a debate going on in D.C. right now this week around um, AEI is saying state disinvestment does not cause tuition increases. Um, And there's – and that's sort of – opposite as what a lot of the research has shown um, and, and the arguments that we make. And Betsy, you know, at the same time, Betsy DeVos has said she wants to scrap HEA and start all over. Uh, Senator Patty Murray from Washington, who, who is the ranking member on the HELP Committee, is opposed. And we think even Alexander would be opposed to blowing the whole thing up and starting over. There are a range of discussions going on around accreditation. Uh, the Republican idea is to open up accreditation to employers and they will pursue that in HEA, sort of an expansion of the boot camp model. A lot more discussion about data transparency. Um, the student unit record is still kind of a hot you know, potato topic. Um, I think that if we didn't have a House Republican committee leader who was so wholesale opposed to what she sees as an invasion of privacy, you would see it pass because there is a desire to be able to see the returns on education and where students are coming out, um, and that that helps prove the effectiveness of higher ed. Uh, If anything is to happen this year, it probably would happen around the FAFSA simplification side. People still get that it's, you know, a a disconcerting um, form. And uh, around Pell, there's no discussion of increasing the awards. One good piece of legislation that was introduced that won't go anywhere at the end of the day, but sets um, some popular markers uh, or markers for popular reforms among Democrats um, it is found in the Pell Grant Preservation and Expansion Act, and that in, in expands Pell eligibility to more students like Dreamers, lifts the ban on Pell for incarcerated individuals, which Danny Davis is really passionate about, provides more money to students by increasing Pell and expanding aid calculations, indexes it to inflation permanently, allows low-income students to protect more of their earned income. So really a great bill. Um, And that is a part of of a set of uh, bills that the House Democrats are going to release called Aim Higher. Um, Many of you probably know the 2017 Appropriations Bill restored year-round Pell Grant. Um, It is limited to students attending at least half-time, and the Secretary has said it will be ready to use on July 1st. Any questions before I move on quickly to the last point? And yes, my son really liked that one. Um, so uh, in closing, this was the original thing that Mary, Mary Kay and I talked about, me talking about this joint agency letter that was pretty 
uh, provocative and exciting um, that was focused on aligning federal supports and program delivery for college access and completion and includes the secretaries of all those um, departments and a lot of work went on um, to come, around, come together around aligning these policies and there was an interagency working group that continues to meet actually and they had actually taken a lot of recommendations from the area that I've been working in in the last several years in terms of how student supports can promote college completion. And the, the guidance letter, we have summary, I can include a link, Mary Kay, to it um, from our website, um, but it, it you know, provides a lot of guidance around state's ability to average work hours um, across a month for SNAP, um, using, uh, encouraging SNAP and Medicaid participants to complete the FAFSA. We'd never seen that before, a foster care transition toolkit, homeless youth fact sheet, which might be helpful to a few of you that asked. Um, it also clarifies the Section 8 student rule, which is right now kind of punitive and encourages housing authorities to be more supportive of students. Um, and so things like that, as well as looking at the tax credits um, and, and uh, providing more information about that. And so just to remind everyone, you know, why we talk about public benefits and tax credits in the context of higher education, and that is that, that by the benefit, you know, you have the benefit of mac maximizing access to public info supports. Um, that meet those five different areas. Uh, but then we need to think about, you know, how well are our policies aligned and are states taking the right options? For instance, letting women who are receiving TANF access longer term education and training um, and those sorts of things. So on that note, I will um, wrap it up and turn it over to Sarah. And if we have any time, you know, happy to answer any more questions or you can shoot me over email. And, uh, and that's it. It was a pleasure talking to you. So I will keep my, my update brief. Um, I just want to talk about two bills, things I've, I think we've talked about in this, um, in this council before that are somewhat positive. They passed, passed both houses, um, and I think they have a good a chance of being signed as well. Uh, Gabby can probably talk about one even better than I can, but I'll talk about the first one. So um, the first one is HB 2740. Um, it's re regarding alternative credentials. So Women Deployed took port part in a task force uh, a few, maybe two years ago, that began two years ago, um, there we go, that recommended, that recommended um, expansion to all high school equivalency tests that are currently available. But in addition <coughs> to that expansion, we wanted to look at alternatives to testing, right? Because there are a number of students uh, who maybe have almost all of their high school credits, but they're just missing that math class that they can't seem to finish. Um, and so if they were to pass, let's say, the GED math section, could we look into then giving them a high school equivalency certificate, right? They may not be, <coughs> they may not ever be proficient in geometry, but that doesn't mean they're not proficient enough in math to move forward. Um, so we recommended, basically, that Illinois start to develop credentials among them like that. Um, and the General Assembly basically turned that recommendation into something codified into law that the uh, Illinois Community College Board has to start looking into how to develop them and really flesh out what do they look like. And that's tough, right? Because it's, it's making sure that we aren't telling students who are in high school currently that they can sort of like drop out, take a GED test yeah. and, and, and be, um, and get their high school equivalency. So right. there's some work to be done there to really figure out what the details of the piece are. Um, but we're kind of building off a model that Wisconsin has had for a long time. They have alternative methods of credentialing. Um, and so it's passed both houses. Um, mm -hmm. And it will, it will be helpful, again, for those students who are just missing that like one course or uh, who's already started their post-secondary credits and those post-secondary credits could be sort of reverse transferred into their into their high school diploma and give them a high school equivalency certificate. Um, so that's one good bill. Uh, the other good bill, and again, I will ask Gabby, who may know more, is credit for prior learning. So this bill passed both houses. Many, many, many adults go back to the work back to school after having been in the workforce for several years, and I think this is. Certainly, this is something that is really understandable if you're looking at the military, and there's also a similar military bill 
related to this, right? There are specific jobs in the military where you're going to learn a set of skills and those are easy to codify and quantify and um, or somewhat easier and and those are could be trans transferred into credit uh, at the cost. <coughs> it cuts down on time, it cuts down on money, and it, they're skills that people learned over the course of their lives yeah. and using experience. Um, so again, another bill passed to both houses this year that directs the Community College Board and the Board of Higher Ed to, and, and then colleges and universities, public colleges and universities, to start thinking about how to integrate this into their work or into their credit um, transfer. Um, you know, those years are education. They're just not traditional education and they're deserving. <coughs> so these two bills are positive steps that the state is taking. I mean, there's still no budget. Um, so, you know, we may see that these don't go as quickly as we might li like, but um, both of them are, are solid steps in the right direction for the state. Um, no, I agree. I just, you know, to the point of no budget and kind of being on both of them are kind of unfunded mandates, mm -hmm. right? Because I think they do IBAG, city colleges, and everybody else has no money. <laughs> so to say, like, okay, now go do this. <laughs> yes, it's the right thing to say, but without the money attached to it, it's pretty hard to put it into action. I, I would fully agree with that, but when when and if <laughs> we ever have a budget again. I think, you know, what we are building is a good policy foundation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, it may take us a while to build back to that model of that, that Illinois has been in some ways for adult education or really education overall, higher education overall, but we still have that foundation and I think the state's still willing to work there. Any questions for me or for Amy? Are, are these bills uh, particularly helpful to the people that are trying to switch careers later? Uh, so credit for prior learning, more Definitely. probably more so than the alternative credential bill, but yes, because somebody who started in a career that they were able to get right out of high school um, and maybe they're, they, that's been transferred overseas or robotics has made it obsolete, um, are then able to use all those skills that they gained in that career to get some credit for that learning <coughs> that they gained and then start uh, college at a, you know, with 15 to 30 credits. Yeah. Especially for veterans. Right. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge for veterans yeah, as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. I would think it also has potential for older people. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it, I, I would say more so for older people probably is, is it's more helpful, which is why yeah. Kale does a lot of work on it, adult and experiential yeah. learning being an important part of your job. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Dana Gross, Dana Gross on the phone said, are you in contact with programs that already exist? And Dana, if you want to ask or build on that question, you can just hit star seven to unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, and that should have been a, a question mark, but I'm watching this on my phone. Um, so <laughs> so I, that was not an exclamation mark. Um, right, so there are, I mean, there are certainly adult education programs out there. I participated in one that already exists that, right, look at um, – look at certifications and turn that into credit, look at prior learning, look at uh, on the job learning. Um, and as you know, they assign tuition and obviously it's, it, well, in this program at DePaul, it's it's less expensive if you're able to say, you know, you spend, it's two, maybe, I don't, I don't know, it's like $250 to write the assessment around a, um, around a learning uh, module and have them evaluate it and then assign credit and move you through the program. So are we, are we in contact with those kinds of programs to help support whatever needs to be supported, um, you know, get success stories out of there? Yeah, and Kale actually, I mean, so, so Gabby and her organization do this same um, pro portfolio review as well. Um, so certainly there, there are programs, there are universities and colleges that have, um, have programs in place. The goal of, of a bill like this is really to standardize it, or not standardize it, but also make sure that everybody is bought in so transfers are, so people are capable of transferring from institution to institution, 
Right now, while DePaul has a program, um, you know, that may not be accepted by a, if somebody were to transfer within Illinois. So right. the goal is right. to take those really solid programs that we know are working, and again, Kale, Kale is one of them, um, and to really expand them and make sure that the whole state has bought into the, into the system. Okay. And also that adults know that it's an option and a right. choice. Right. Um, because a lot of times when we're working with the school, they say, oh, yeah, we do prior learning assessment. But nobody really wants to do mm -hmm. it. You know, yeah. we, you know, mm -hmm. we review right. five portfolios a year. And then, you, I mean, if you don't know it, you don't know you don't want it. Right, right. Right, right. And also to make it clear that while $250 may seem like a lot, if you're getting 15 credits out of it, it's not. So, right. um, so I think all of those things are are good help. Well, I had a question. Would this include um, immigrants? I mean, we have an awful lot of immigrants with, you know, advanced degrees, right. Right. lawyers, doctors, and are washing dishes because nobody wants to look at their credentials. Right. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Do you? It's really tough. Yeah, I yeah. think the I think from what I can tell, it would, this is directing like schools to like really figure out what their policies are going to be. So some schools may move in that direction, and I think that's an advocacy option, opportunity for uh, with the Community College Board and with the Board of Higher Education to say, let's look at this as well. But do you know the group Upward and Global? No. I think I've heard of it. Yes. Yeah, so they work with um, new immigrants yeah. to this country, many who are very credentialed um, okay. around job placement. And the other thing, too, in our organization, we do a lot of foreign credentialing evaluation, and there are a lot of agencies that we encourage people to get their credentials evaluated so they have a standard against whatever credential they're going up for, and then they can take that portably wherever they want to go, because that's the easiest way to figure it out, is that, you know, there are people that are much more qualified to evaluate that than some, you know, universities or colleges. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah, but it's not not inexpensive. First, they have to get it translated, and then they have that's to get true. evaluated. That's true. And then that's it's really up to the college. So, that's true. you know, they could have tons of credits, and the college said, no, mm -hmm. yeah. just yeah, because it's true. from a different country, we're not going to accept it. Yeah. Well, Let's mark that one down. As a, as a I wrote it down, and, and especially since Sarah was on the team. Um, we just had a couple items before we closed today's meeting. So this is what action alerts look like. So if you get an email that looks like this, we usually always have the header so then when you just see it on your phone or your screen, you know that's the action alert. If you aren't getting emails like this, check your spam or mark the box on the sign-in sheet, and I'll double check and make sure that you're on the list. Um, based on the really massive cuts to higher education that we're seeing in the proposed federal budget that Amy outlined, Amy Ellen outlined for us, we do have a chance for you to take action today. Um, I will also include this link um, when I follow up. And otherwise, I think we sent this on June 6th, so it could be hiding in your inbox, but um, the fight continues. And then the second item uh, for action today is equal pay. Um, and so the good news coming out of Springfield is that House Bill 2462 received overwhelming bipartisan support. I mean, just incredible, across the aisle support. And it's called the No Salary History Bill that closes the loophole on our Equal Pay Act in Illinois. And I'm guessing if you've read your emails and most of the women around the table are pretty informed, it basically closes the loophole for employers to ask the question on what your salary history was. Because as we know, if women start off in their careers already making less than their male counterparts mm -hmm. in their first job coming out of college and coming out of school, then they're shackled with that lower salary their entire adult lives. Um, and so just like employers don't say, oh, are you married? Are you pregnant? Are you going to get pregnant? Are you going to get married? <laughs> uh, then likewise, they wouldn't ask this question. And really encouraging employers to pay people what they are worth uh, and what the value of the job is and having nothing to do with um, can they get a discount on your pay based on your prior salary. So um, we are going to be coming at this from a lot of different angles. I encourage you, you can write down Governor Rahner's phone number and contact him, leave him a message, either on your voicemail or sometimes he'll get through to a staff person. 
We're going to post this image on our Facebook account tomorrow because we're going to be doing an event that this is one of the big topics. So, I ch you know, check back on Women Employed Facebook and then you can share this image. We're also going to do some postcards and some virtual things in the coming week. So, I just say, like, pay attention to your Women Employed emails. If you're on social media, there will be a lot of chatter. Is there some, oh sorry, is there some doubt that um, Browner will sign? It just seems like meh. You know, like, there's a whole list of bills that he's like, no way in hell over my dead body. It goes against all of my, you know, agenda, <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> brand plan. And this one, it's like there's such strong support that, like, long-time advocates, like, Melissa Joseph's like, how can he not mm. sign this? And especially with all the other foolishness around HB 40 and coming out against women's reproductive rights, even though in his campaign was for women's reproductive choice. Um, some of the other kind of inside advocates are like, he needs something for women and progressive women and kind of like power county women. Uh, so that's sort of like our strategic goal, as they might say, thinking uh, of why he mm -hmm. should sign this bill. There was also a the Sun Times uh, article yeah. yesterday that, that had 10 bills that he should he sign, should sign. Oh, and wow. this was one of those bills. Oh, good. So there's pressure on from other people, but we need to really pump up, up that pressure yeah. because I really do feel like it's one that could fall through his cracks. Yeah, yeah. this is kind of, yeah, like <coughs> in opposition. You know, in the bill, that means eliminating that question from yeah. all kinds of thousands and thousands of applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what it means. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It would be illegal to ask the question Yeah. in any way. So, because you are a group of people who like to come together, I want to give you another <laughs> chance. Um, so, if anybody remembers, Michelle Obama hosted this awesome <laughs> summit last year mm -hmm. called the United State of Women, and Valerie Jarrett, and her role on the White House Council of Women and Girls, was the chairperson, and they had this, like, awesome star-studded conversation with Oprah and Meryl mm -hmm. Streep and, you know, everybody else. And the big sort of punchline to that conversation was so many people that traveled to D.C. said, so then what? You know, now what do we do at the local level? Now what do we do back in our states and our cities? And so Valerie Jarrett and um, Tina Chen, who was the chief of staff for Michelle Obama, if I want to make sure I get her title correct, um, have launched the Galvanize program. And it's just like the verb says. They are trying to galvanize the conversations that they started last year at the White House Summit. Um, July 15th and 16th, it's Saturday and Sunday, Big full days for the $50 registration fee. It is like 9 to 8 to 9 to 6 with training tracks and breakout sessions, lots of speakers. Our very own uh, Ileana Mora, our incoming CEO and president, has been invited to help kick off the summit. Uh, and she'll be on the first plenary panel um, with some other local leaders talking about just sort of the status of women. And Ileana will specifically be speaking about um, creating fairer workplaces. Uh, for working women. Where so, is that going to be? So it's going to be in McCormick Place. Um, the link is here. We're also going to send out an invitation to women employed supporters this week just to make sure people know. And the only other two things I'll say, so they're anticipating between 500 and 1,000 women. Um, we're serving on the host committee, and it's just a really great cross-section of partner organizations, city agencies, state agencies, county agencies. Um, so the fee is $50. They don't want to turn anyone away. So if you or anyone you know that you're like, oh, we should, you know, mm -hmm. I sent something over to the um, folks at Instituto mm -hmm. and Central Romero. I, like, I just went through my partners list. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, please share widely and please tell participants, members, et cetera, um, that scholarships are available. And this so I'll be uh, No, yeah. it's uh, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. Oh, I'm looking, yeah. It's like, I'm in 2018. No, I don't know. No, I'm in. <laughs> I just, we know we're trying to recruit volunteers. Yeah. It's been it like burned in my brain again. Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah. July um, 15th, 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 15th. 15th. So we'll be putting out an announcement. It'll be on Twitter that you can share with your friends. Um, and also, the good news people have heard about yeah. the Anne Lackey Leadership Fund. We're going to sponsor 30 young women who are already affiliated with the organization through the Advocacy Council, our summer leaders, our summer leader alumni. Um, and speaking of young women, uh, so we do a summer mixer every year, and I just wanted to put this out here. I brought some flyers because, you know, I joke it's like our 2040 club. Uh, we never ID at the door. We're not going to turn you away. But it really is a chance for sort of young women who are emerging as leaders in the, the gender equity movement to get together. It's just going to be across the street at the Emerald Loop. Uh, and we're actually going to have our summer leaders, um, so kind of our group of 10 young women 
uh, joining advocacy council members on July 26th. So if there are young women in your lives, you know, people on your staff, team, family, uh, that you want to help spread the word, um, it's really fun. And it's also just a great opportunity because we don't do like business meetings, quote unquote, uh, with the advocacy council during the summer because so many people travel and are away. So we get together in July, we take August off, and then uh, we get back to work in September. And with that, I'm going to ask Laurel to close out the meeting. Make sure folks have your calendars out for <laughs> the next Okay. Day. So first of all, we have to thank, and we've already done that, uh, Amy Ellen, for wonderful, Yay. wonderful overview thank update. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sarah, as always, our in-house expert, um, and uh, Mary Kay, we never thank you, but we need to, so thank you so much for all the hard work you do. Uh, and all, for all of you who participated virtually, thank you. This was, our, I guess, our first time doing this. I know. So it, I thought it went pretty well. We even got the plug put in for the computer not going down, so that was good. <laughs> yeah, okay. And a, that was great. Uh, a special thanks to everybody for taking action, and I'm going to check mine too. I think I'm on it, but I don't know for yeah, sure, to make that. sure uh, that we continue to take action um, asking Governor Ronner to make equal pay reality for working women in Illinois, because that is powerful. So our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, September 13th, from 12 to 1.30 at the same location here at the There's Women Employee. Mm -hmm. It's on a Wednesday, so please mark your calendars. Our guest will be Sherlandra. Brooks, who is the senior program manager uh, here at Women Employed, okay? Uh, and she will give us an update on career foundations. Her picture is up there. Uh, while she's new to Women Employed staff, she's not new to the work. Before joining Women Employed, she worked for 14 years leading the development and implementation of, implementation of healthcare bridge and ca career pathway programming. That's a lot to say. But anyway, she's wonderful, so we're excited. We'll get more information from Mary Kay as time, uh, as the summer goes on. Enjoy your summers. Come out for some of the activities that are planned and continue to support and stay involved. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.